Domanus Sabonis' status as a player may just be one of the most heavily disputed conversations I've seen. This season, he's been absolutely dominating the box score, leading the league in rebounds by a decent margin, ranking 5th in assists per game, while also averaging an uber-efficient 20. Yet, there seems to be a pretty big disparity in the numbers he's able to produce and how he's perceived by the general public. For one, he didn't make the All-Star game despite filling the stat sheet for a team that's consistently been in the playoff race. And many fans will point to last year's playoff series against the Warriors to make the case that he's just way too flawed to be a centerpiece on a competitive team. I think some of the concerns are valid, but I also think that a lot of what he does offensively is just straight up misunderstood. The most under-discussed aspect of his game is how good he is at pushing the pace. As a team, the Kings average about 14 seconds per offensive possession, fourth in the NBA, and while some of that can be attributed to the speed of guys like Fox and Monk, the driving force behind this style of play is Sabonis. He's a massive defensive rebounder, leading the league at over 10 a game, and all of their wings know to leak out so that they can start the break. And while Domas is great at making these outlet passes, it's actually his grab-and-go game that really stands out. If nobody steps up to slow his momentum, he'll take it coast to coast. And by stepping up, I mean someone has to meet him early and stop the ball, because if he's given space to attack, he'll drop his shoulder and force his way to the rim. So over and over again, you'll see him grab defensive rebounds, beat opposing bigs down the floor as he initiates transition offense, then as soon as someone steps up to stop the ball, he's finding a streaking teammate for easy points. Watch him on this one. After grabbing a board and starting the break, his head is on a swivel as he locates every defender and every potential weapon, surveying the entire floor before making a decision, and with a little up fake, Malik Monk's got a wide open triple. In the event that there is no lane for him to attack as a driver, and no streaking teammate to find with a pass, that's when he'll instead move laterally and set up a handoff, creating a 2 on 1 advantage before the defense ever knew what hit him. Those two men actions are their bread and butter. Sabonis spends almost all of his time on offense operating in the middle as everyone moves around him, and they'll clear out for him to hand it off to any one of their wings. He's constantly making reads in these spots, like here he keeps the ball instead of handing it off, and Herter keeps moving along the perimeter before setting a pin down for Keegan Murray to come run the two-man game, and he ends up with a high quality three. These quick lateral actions are a great way to counter his lack of shooting ability. You'll see a lot of defenses intentionally leave him open, hoping he'll settle, but he only takes one three a game, and even less for mid-range, instead using the handoffs to create spacing and force opposing bigs to either play up or live with a ball handler attacking. So for the most part, he's stretching rim protectors by forcing them to play on the ball, which opens up the paint for a play like this where Monk rejects the handoff on a backdoor cut. Here's another example. They're setting up a handoff, and he keeps the ball while Monk cuts back, which leads to a real easy give and go and open dunk for the big man. All of these quick decisions, constantly moving the ball and setting up second or third actions, whether that's with extra passes, handoffs, the offense is constantly revolving around him and his ability to make the right read, and I think it's a skill set that most bigs just simply can't replicate. Here's a look at every player in the NBA averaging at least 30 touches a game, and how many minutes they spend with the ball in their hands. You can see it's a pretty direct correlation. The more you touch the ball, the more you have it. Which is why in the top right, you get those more heliocentric types of offensive players who control everything. And people really started to catch on when Jokic became a complete outlier in that he touches the ball more than anyone, but because all of the decisions he makes are so quick, he's nowhere near the top in actual time of possession. Well, Sabonis is every bit as much of an outlier right now, second behind Jokic in touches while not even in the top 50 in possession time. What's even more interesting is when we remove all other positions from the equation though, and just look at centers. It really puts into perspective just how much more control these guys have within their offensive systems than any other big around the league. And the reason for that becomes very clear when we look at the relationship between touches and turnovers. As bigs start to operate on the ball more, they become turnover prone, but Sabonis has such a rare skill set. 
Some of it has to do with system and personnel, but I really don't think there are many bigs who can replicate what he does to the degree that he does it. Here's one that starts with him stretching a rim protector to the ball up top as the Kings start some off-ball action on both sides of the floor, and all it takes is one miscue for Fox to end up with a lob. Then as soon as he's initiating action, and that big completely abandons him to protect the rim, again, he's not going to settle for the jumper, instead attacking that space on a drive just like in transition, and forcing his way to a layup. As a result, bigs sort of have to play him straight up, and then he'll get into the handoff game with literally anyone. As a team, they're averaging 11.5 handoff points a game, while no other team is even over 7. Actually, it's the highest mark by any team since the tracking started back in 2015. This has become what they're known for. As for the individual recipients, they have 4 players in the top 20 in handoff scoring, 3 in the top 10, including Keegan Murray who's 3rd at 2.8 points a game, and Herder who leads the league at 2.9. Credit to these guys for taking advantage of these actions, whether that's through shooting or driving, but there's a reason Sabonis is able to get the entire team involved in the two-man game, and that's the fact that he might just be the best screener in the entire NBA. It's a super underrated skill that nobody really mentions, but because he's so good at it, pretty much any time they set up these actions, they're pretty much guaranteed a two-on-one advantage. Take this play for example, Sabonis hands it off to Monk and there's no lane to attack, so he comes back for a second screen that takes Dinwiddie out of the play, forcing AD to jump out, and that's a free 2 points. I'm not sure I've ever seen a player more worthy of having the brick wall badge on Hall of Fame. Just look at this one, completely folding a chasing defender to turn the possession into a power play before catching inside and throwing it down on a shot blocker. Sabonis is an incredible finisher around the rim, and what I like most is his aggression. Even with Rudy Gobert positioned perfectly in his deep drop coverage, he takes it right at him for a bucket. Anytime he's met with drop like that, he'll attack the space with his shoulder. Turner's already recovering from the side, and by going into his chest he creates some separation for a layup. Here's another example. The big sits way back, so when he gets it in the short roll, he could very easily get to a mid-range jumper, or maybe a floater like many other bigs would do. Like I said, he doesn't settle though, instead using the shoulder and an up fake to create an opportunity at 3 from the line. Another thing that helps him as a finisher is that he's a pretty gifted vertical athlete. So on a play like this where the big is late to get back to him, it's not the shoulder bump, rather going up over the top. This season, he's attempting just under 8 shots at the rim every 75 possessions, good for the 96th percentile, and he's made about 71% of them. Those sort of interior scoring numbers can really stack up to almost anyone. Yet, there seems to be an idea that because a lot of his opportunities are assisted, they're created for him, or easy finishes, but that just is not the case at all. Actually, according to playbyplaystats.com, his shot quality of 0.55 is actually lower than some notable slashers like Giannis, Zion, RJ Barrett, or Westbrook, which really speaks to his ability to score through traffic or with added contact. And that only makes his true shooting percentage of 65.8, while scoring 20 points a game, so much more impressive. His ability to get downhill and finish creates some issues when it comes to covering the two-man game. Against a team like Denver who wants to hedge, it's tough to recover, and relying on a forward to rotate down and meet him at the rim isn't exactly ideal. When putting two on the ball, you pretty much need a third defender to slide over from the weak side and get to Sabonis before he can build that momentum, to which he'll counter by showcasing some more of that high-level passing. On this next one, you're going to see the defense start in a drop, but after a big screen, Isaiah Jackson is forced to switch onto the ball and turns away Fox's attempt, only for Sabonis to put it right back up with ease. He's one of the best offensive rebounders in the NBA, ranked 5th at 3.5 per game, and the way he so relentlessly crashes the glass like this allows him to consistently punish mismatches. As does his low post game. Whenever he finds himself with a smaller player switched onto him, he'll steal off position deep in the paint for free points. 
and this area of his game pairs really well with the way they like to push pace, because getting down the floor quickly often leaves him with cross matches, which he'll attack with the back to the basket game. Against switches or mismatches, it's really difficult to stop him from generating easy opportunities, so when he sets up, defenses tend to bring extra attention, whether that's a double or a rim protector roaming to his side, and that of course opens up more opportunities as a playmaker. When it all comes together, you're left with a guy who can just abuse smaller lineups. First, it's the inside position, collapsing the defense and kicking it out to a shooter for a wide open three and when it's missed, he's right there for a second chance, putting it right back up for two plus a foul. With that said, his post game isn't nearly as effective when the other team throws size at him. On the season, he's averaging just over two points a game in the post on a relatively inefficient 0.93 points per attempt. He tends to rely heavily on physical advantages to kind of bully his way into hooks or layups and doesn't really have any counters. He's uncomfortable turning over his left shoulder, the footwork can be choppy at times, his offhand isn't the greatest, so like I said, when teams throw big bodies at him, that's why he'll operate primarily out in space. Now, people will take this limitation and run with it, but it's only such a small part of his vast offensive arsenal. The way he operates as a sort of point center brings a level of movement and connectivity to the team that otherwise wouldn't exist. Over the last two seasons, he's played nearly 5,000 minutes, and in that time, the team averages 29 assists every 100 possessions. That's incredible. And in about 2,000 minutes without him, that drops all the way under 25. To really put that into perspective, the difference between 29 and 24.7 would be the difference between being ranked 5th and 29th this year. I'd also like to point out that his unique skill set takes a ton of the decision making load away from their guards and wings who can focus more on attacking, which is why despite having such a disparity in assists with Domas, they still average more turnovers without him. There are other things he clearly improves while on the floor, such as the volume of attempts they get at the rim and the percentage they shoot when they get there or overall shot quality, and it all falls under the scope of offensive efficiency in general. A 120.5 offensive rating with him on the floor, more than elite, and a 5 point swing to 115 without him. Look, say what you want about some of his defensive limitations, or the fact that he's not a great outside shooter, isn't some big time isolationist, and maybe can't create his own shot to the degree of many others, but that doesn't take away from what he excels at, pushing the pace, getting everyone involved with his passing, screening and quick decisions, finishing plays at the rim, and of course punishing mismatches. He's one of the best offensive bigs in the NBA, and has played a major role in a complete franchise turnaround by the Kings. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of Sabonis. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.